All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast, and football players are on campus working out officially. We are still in quarantine. I think individually, at least Wes and Chris and I, continue to be apart, which continues to weigh heavily on my heart, but we're continuing continuing to do our part in terms of social distancing. But players are back on campus also doing their part in terms of social distancing, working out in pods, and Will Muschamp has laid out the extensive protocol that is in place to make sure that players stay as safe as humanly possible throughout the workout period and hopefully into the practice period. He spoke to Collective Media on Monday morning via a teleconference, and we'll get into many of the things that he had to say, and he had a lot to say about the social unrest around the country, about the protests that South Carolina participated in on Friday, about COVID-19 procedures, and of course, about some football things, but we will start today with a quick recruiting note because this is a topical. Chris Clark has the piece up on GamecockCentral.com like 15 hours ago, 18 hours ago. So this is still pretty hot off the press with South Carolina grabbing another commitment. Uh, what number, like five or six of, of quarantine? I, I don't know why I'm sort of, I have this like mental demarcation of guys committing during this period, but it's a three-star running back. It's Caleb McDowell, a guy that was initially committed to North Carolina State and seems to have made his way to Columbia to continue to be with Des Kitchings, who was, uh, I guess, I don't know if he was his primary recruiter, but would have at least been his position coach at NC State. Uh, Chris, take me a little bit more behind Caleb McDowell's recruitment. Well, so Kitchings, you know, was not going to be at State this year. Um, you know, he, he was actually out for – he was out for a bit, um, but – there was obviously some knowledge that Kitchens had of him from, you know, being in the state, being at NC State, um, recruiting running backs throughout the Southeast. Dowell, of course, from Georgia. It's a guy that committed to, to NC State, I believe, earlier this year. And it's a little bit short-lived. You know, once Kitchens got to South Carolina, as you can imagine, the board sort of gets reset there. Um, you know, some guys that are on the board stay on. There's some new guys that jump on the board. McDowell is one of those, you know, where there was – you know, it's sort of an uptick in involvement, and it, it pretty quickly, you know, advanced. And so he picked up the offer from South Carolina, you know, not too long ago. And from there, South Carolina very quickly became a major factor. You know, Kitching certainly was a factor there, uh, but but McDowell has since said that Mike Bobo, who you know has a lot of ties to that South Georgia area, Lee County, where Jamie Robinson is from, you know, is the high school McDowell plays at after uh, spending time at Bainbridge. Georgia earlier in his career and so there's just a lot of ties natural ties and Bobo and Kitchens both knew about him and really liked him and so uh, even during this recruiting shutdown you know McDowell once he picked up that SEC offer from South Carolina that was the direction he wanted to go. Uh, Chris I, I don't remember the exact cutoff and I, I mentioned it on my local show yesterday and also prefaced it by saying I'm probably wrong but right now according to Rivals he is a 5'7 Three star guy and is the or, or five either five seven or five six. What's the cutoff for three star to four star? So the cutoff is a, a three star has got basically three sort of sub levels if you want to call them that. A five point five is the lowest. Then you got a five point six and a five point seven is the highest. That's that's right in that range. Once you get to that five eight sort of sub level, that bumps you up to four star status. Gotcha. Okay, so he's he's I, I guess sort of in that middle ground. I was thinking it was. Five seven was sort of the low tier four star, but I guess that's five eight. But point is, you know, still has his senior year to go. Still a lot of football to be played, and it's interesting as we've talked about so many recruits this early in the recruiting process. You know, haven't even probably started practicing for their senior seasons. Um, and I'll ask you, I guess, about the sort sort of the nature of this commitment in just a second. But uh, real quick, give me kind of the rundown on what kind of kid he is. He's listed at five ten one seventy. Again, he's. 17 I guess right now maybe even 16 depending on uh when his birthday is so he's a young kid he'll probably grow a little bit more certainly get a little bit bigger but is he more of a speed guy more of a power guy more balanced what's what kind of skill set will he bring to South Carolina well you know he's a guy that maybe is not to draw a comparison to someone who recently got on campus in South Carolina he's not like Marshawn Lloyd in that he's not going to be a you know, 225, I mean, he could get there, but I'll be sort of doubtful. He puts on 50 pounds and becomes a bigger back. And he's probably not going to be that every down type back. But what he is, is, you know, he's 5'10", 175, but he's put together well. You know, what Wes had some really good observations yesterday on that when we were chatting about McDowell and that he's put together really well. He's got a really strong lower body. 
Um, you know, he's, he's got a video out there of him in high school parallel squatting, you know, 600 pounds. So he's got some power. And talking to his high school coach yesterday, he's got really good straight line speed, um, but he can also make guys miss. He's got sort of that what they call short area quickness where he can change directions. He can make a guy miss. A little wiggle? He, he, he's got a little wiggle, and, and he's a little more powerful maybe than he'll get credit for. He's not going to be a – you know, a huge tackle. He's not going to be a huge run-through contact guy in college just because of the size profile. But he can get a little bigger, a little stronger. He's already a pretty naturally strong kid. He's a really good player in space. So when you look at McDowell, he's a guy that you can use, you know, situationally as a ball carrier, certainly. Uh, he's got that ability. But he can also catch the ball at the backfield screen game. You can maybe put him in the slot. He can also contribute on special teams as a return guy. You know, he's got a, a track record on kick return and punt return as well. So just, you know, as South Carolina has looked to add more athleticism and speed at the skill positions, we look at Sam Reynolds, who's a guy that's, you know, he's thought of as sort of a slot wide out, but he can do some different things. Mm-hmm. McDowell's thought of as a little bit more of a running back, but he can also do a lot of things for you. And the common denominator there is they just feel like these are guys who are good players in space that bring some speed and some wiggle. And, and that's something that, frankly, they need a little bit more of. Right, just playmaking in general. And that's what we talked a lot during the season last year that it felt like that was lacking for South Carolina. So, Wes, we talk a lot about versatility defensively, you know, linemen that can play inside or out, linebackers that can defend the run or play in space. Obviously, South Carolina specifically doing a lot of cross-training between all the different positions in the defensive backfield. But we don't talk as much about the positional versatility on offense I guess maybe with the exception of the offensive line but it it seems like you mentioned Sam Reynolds Chris but Wes I mean obviously Christian McCaffrey is like an incredible upside because I mean dude could win an MVP in the NFL at some point but a Christian McCaffrey Christian Kirk um, because he's not an every down back do do you think he has the skill set to do some of that you know slot work or or special teams work I know right now kind of thinking running back but is Carolina projecting a, a, a bigger upside in terms of versatility for him? Yeah, the the guy he was compared to to me was was Naheem Hines, who was uh, obviously a guy that was at NC State. Yeah, another Kitchings guy. There, and uh, yeah, was, was recruited by Des Kitchings at, at NC State, and you know was a thousand yard rusher there. But the guy they moved around, uh, you know, helped in special teams. You could put him in the slot, use him in the jet sweep game as well. And you know that that was the first name that was mentioned to me. You know, Naheem was a little bit more highly recruited, highly rated. Uh, I went back, Naheem was a, a four-star, low four-star kid. But, you know, I, I think that's a, a pretty valid comparison. And, you know, this is a kid that, if you want to talk about versatility, actually played a ton of defense this past season. Um, you know, actually, from what I've read and heard, he was sort of used on that side of the ball because that's where they needed him the most. They had some some veterans, some seniors on the offensive side that could carry the load or part of the load at, at running back. So mm-hmm. he really took over more of a defensive role this past season. And I, I, I like the toughness he shows if you watch him on defense. So, you know, I, I think as far as versatility, he, he's got a lot of that on both sides of the ball. He's someone, if you're rating him as a prospect, you know, Chris made the point yesterday on our YouTube live stream, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, by the way, Gamecock Central, the, uh, you know, anytime you got a prospect that if it doesn't work out for one reason or another at one position has the ability to play another, that sort of gives you a little bit more upside as a prospect. And this is a kid that I, I think if it didn't work out on offense, could always go play defense, certainly could help you in the kickoff return game, maybe the punt return game as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I think you, you really just are going to look to to move him around and give him the ball in a, in a number of ways if he can continue to do the same things he shows in high school at the college level. So maybe someone that could just as appropriately be classified as an athlete as opposed to a running back? Yeah, you know, I, I would say certainly as far as what South Carolina wants him as, you would put him as a running back. But as far as what he's capable of doing from a big picture standpoint, yeah, I think athlete is um, is very much appropriate. And, uh, man, I mean, the, like Chris said, the fact that uh, someone that size can bench pre- – or excuse me, can, can squat 600 pounds um, – is is just crazy so (laughs) there are are obviously some just athletic gifts here and you you don't get to numbers like that without being a hard worker so i I think anytime you know fans want to fans always want the four or five star guys that's obvious but um you have to have guys that sort of fill out your roster as well and those guys a they better be driven uh b they better be tough 
And I, I think this is a kid that sort of just epitomizes what you're looking for uh, in the guys that you're going to fill out your roster with, even if he wasn't some super highly recruited high four-star or five-star guy. Well, and the other thing that you look at, uh, at least I do, is, is try to just look at the offer list. And Chris, for McDowell, it's not a huge offer list. It's you know, it's Army, it's Cincinnati, it's Colorado, East Carolina, Florida Atlantic. Yeah, you do have NC State in there, obviously, and he was committed there. And as I'm looking, uh, according to rivals, his uh, primary recruiter was uh, Kurt Roper. So another kind of funny connection there between South Carolina and NC State. <laughs> but is that does that indicate that this is sort of a reach for South Carolina, or does that just have to do with? So much of the recruiting that's going on right now is early in the process, so a lot of the other schools that maybe would have, would have or will still get involved later just haven't gotten involved yet. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a reach because, you know, obviously we're in a really interesting time from from a recruiting perspective. You know, I mean, we, we, are, we are in a situation where it's difficult to evaluate some guys. Now, South Carolina's had – some of the guys on the commitment list they've had in camp previously, but they don't get to see seniors in camp this year. Sort of like, you know, you think back to last year, even some in-state guys, Trey Jones, O'Donnell Fortune, you know, there were some guys that they saw in camp that, um, you know, that, that they offered on the spot and those guys pretty much committed on the spot as well. And so they don't have, they didn't have the spring evaluation period, you know, from April 15th to May 31st, where they can physically go out to schools and eyeball guys and watch them, you know, work out, watch them run. They've got to rely on remote stuff, and then they don't have camp. And so right now it's all about, you know, will some schools, just to make a general point, not about McDowell, will some schools sacrifice some quality this year in favor of filling out a class, or will some schools even sacrifice some numbers just in general, if they don't feel as good at certain positions or about certain guys? I mean, maybe so. It is a tougher situation. You're flying a little bit more blind. But if you've got good info on a kid, you know, at some point you trust your eyes. And so McDowell's a, a guy that they feel like they really like because, you know, they like him on film. They they have, you know, Mike Bobo and Des Kitchings with their ties around the southeast and him being coached by Dean Fabrizio, who has coached a lot of high-level players at Lee County. I think they've won two state titles the past three years, uh, Coach Jamie Robinson there. So there's some carryover to where you feel like you got pretty good info. You know, a lot of people are looking at it and saying, okay, you know, this guy, um, you know, he's a mid three star. Uh, it's an earlier commitment sort of. And then he doesn't, what, where's the other SEC offers? Well, you know, I made the point yesterday. If you are stacking your roster and you're taking 20, 25 guys a year that don't have any other SEC offers, or happen to be mid to low three stars, you know, your chances of winning a title are probably pretty low. But there is room, and it's been proven at every school, that if you're if you're stacking high-level talent, there is room for guys like Caleb McDowell. I mean, there's a lot of examples out at South Carolina. With some of their best teams were loaded with guys that everybody wanted, plus some guys that were a little bit more lightly recruited. Mm -hmm. At Alabama, you know, Josh Jacobs is a guy brought up yesterday. Oklahoma didn't even want him. He's a mid three star. He was awesome. Clemson, you know, yeah, they got Deshaun Watson and all these guys out there, uh, their first title run, but they've also got some guys who were two and three stars. Nobody else wanted. And so it's about stacking no brainers with really good evals. And so what, time will tell, you know, where all these guys, whether they're highly ranked or not, where they are. But, you know, one that we mentioned yesterday, A. Sanders, he was 5'8, 165 coming out of high school. He played at 175. He wasn't your prototypical size guy, but he played on some really good teams and he made a ton of plays. He didn't have a single SEC offer. He was a low four star, but no SEC offers. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is room, I think, for guys like Caleb McDowell on a roster as long as you're making good evals and you're, you got talent around them. Yeah, I mean, Josh Jacobs arguably should have been the NFL's Offensive Rookie of the Year. Uh, and to go back to the other comp, you know, Naheem Hines that you mentioned, uh, Wes, that's a, a guy that's having, having himself an NFL career. So there's there's plenty of room for those guys and I think reason to be optimistic. But that is the uh, latest commit for South Carolina. And I guess as we segue into Will Muschamp's comments from a little bit earlier Monday, I, I'll steal something that he said because I like the way that he said it and apply it, I guess, to this commitment from Caleb McDowell. Wes, would you describe this as a – pretty firm commitment or is this more of what Will Muschamp referred to as a reservation yeah I, I think uh, if, you, if you at least go off of McDowell's words um, you know it, it is a, a firm commitment the chance to play in the SEC was always big for him the relationships there like we talked about um, you know he has actually visited South Carolina before um, you know before he had an offer 
And, you know, I, I, I think it's pretty solid. Now, you always say it with the uh, – you have to say after you say that, um, you never know in recruiting. And, you know, if, if this kid blows up and, and the offer list changes, then, yeah, it's something worth at least tracking. But, you know, I, I think uh, from, from everything the kid said, and from everything leading up to the commitment, you know, pretty much once South Carolina offered, uh, you know, this was where he was going to go. So I think the fact that there was really no hesitation in accepting that offer, that this is where he seemed to want to be uh, from the second he got it, I, I think says a lot about sort of his intentions and, and uh, where he wants to be. Now, uh, you know, if like a Georgia and an Auburn or somebody like that pops in, then can that always change things absolutely you have to acknowledge that but uh you know certainly right now i think south john is where he wants to be well chris that was one of the things that stood out from again what must champs teleconference on monday just because I, I thought it was a funny and honest way of portraying this slew of early commits that we've seen and the three of us have talked about a lot on this podcast but what else that will must said on monday again there was a lot he talked about covid19 and those protocols he talked about his team participating in the protest on Friday. And I think the number that I heard, and I don't know if y'all reported this or where this number came from, but over 100 football players were there, which is at least every scholarship player plus at least most of the walk-ons. That's got to be pretty close to the whole team. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what else jumped out to you from Will Muschamp's teleconference Monday? Well, I mean, just a couple of injury notes in that right now, you know, the team, which uh, it certainly helps that they didn't go through a whole spring. You know, for example, had five spring practices and guys have, been confined to home workouts and not doing as much football stuff just in general so it makes sense but they're fairly healthy you know they had the uh, the ACL injury to Chad Terrell unfortunately on the opposite knee you know tore one last time and tore the other one so he'll be out for a while and um, you know then uh, you know Rescindo Lewis with the quad injury but they should be able to get those guys back for the season so they're they seem pretty healthy right now I think you know just talking about how they've been, you know, some of the protocols they've been going through and and some of those challenges. Um, I don't know if there was anything super, you know, groundbreaking. I thought the, the most, um, you know, the the most interesting thing I honestly thought was, you know, the comments that he made during his opening statement and stuff that that they really didn't have to do with football from a football standpoint. It's just, it's been really interesting to watch because they're, there's so much of just sort of flying blind and everybody just trying to feel their way through it that he said, Hey, we expect a full season, but really I think we've all thought that, you know, for quite a while, our expectations been full season unless something happens and sort of the fans and just how you get there. That's the biggest aspect. And, and I did also think, you know, to go back to this, some of the recruiting points, a, a lot of people are getting really uh, fired up about, Hey, Tennessee's got a full class. And I just think there's some questions remaining there. I mean, how many of those guys they hold on to, whether it's Tennessee or other places, I think we're set for a record number of decommitments, just like we've had a record number of early commitments. And and the question looming of when will in-person recruiting return? And and, and are, is there any movement with, say, signing days or things like that? Do you, do you extend the second signing day past February, for example? I mean, we just don't know these things. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we got to answer some of those questions to sort of get through the season first. Wes, what about you? What stood out to you, uh, whether it's the football stuff, whether it's the social stuff, whether it's the COVID-19 stuff? Again, there was a lot there in, in his opening statement. I think there was there were, there was a lot of intrigue in there. There was a lot of good stuff in there. And, you know, I, I've said this for a while, and I know I probably did this, I did this, what, like not even a month ago, but I, I just, I, I appreciate Will Muschamp's candor. Now he's not always the most honest person with, you know, injuries and like basically anything relating to football. But whenever... It seems like whenever anything bigger than football has come up, I, I've always appreciated how he's addressed it. He's always straightforward in doing so, uh, like he was with recruiting. He's like, yeah, you know what, this is a weird time. And some schools are out there really guilting kids into committing early. We're not about that. And I, and I believe him, and I appreciate his, his earnest approach to that. Um, so I, I'm stepping on your answer now. But what stood out to you from Monday morning? Yeah, I, I would go back to, um, you know, the, the opening statement and just uh... – you know, the fact that uh, I, I thought he had some, some really uh, poignant words when you look at, uh, you know, his thoughts on wishing that the, uh, you know, that sort of society could operate the, the way a locker room does and that, um, you know, you, you may not love the guy next to you, you may not even like the guy next to you, but you, uh, you know, you you respect him. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that there were some, some really nice uh, – words as far as uh, just having his teammates back and uh, or excuse me having his 
his players back. And I, I think, if, you know, if you're going to be a coach and you're going to go into um, a kid's uh, house and say, I'm, I'm going to support you both on the field and off, then, uh, you know, a- actions speak louder than words. And I, I thought the actions of going and, and walking with the team and, and being there for them and being there for something that was important to them and letting them have a platform, I, I thought is, uh, is important, not from a football side, but both from a, a side of off the field, uh, helping your players develop as, as men and as human beings and uh, just, just being there for them. And I, I think some, some people have wanted to turn this into a political thing when really it's not a political thing. I think it's just a matter of, uh, as humans, uh, respecting his players and respecting what they've been through in life and, you know, listening to, to what they're, they're telling you. And I, I think if you're going to be a coach in today's world, you're you're a celebrity, man. Like you're a multimillionaire. Just saying I'm just a coach really doesn't fly anymore. So I, I think um, all all that he said and all that he's done in the last week or so has been very important. He even went so far as to say, you know, I, I can put out a bunch of stuff on social media. I can write a long paragraph, and that doesn't mean as much as what we were able to do collectively as a team on Friday. And I, again, I, I just really appreciated that, especially given that we have seen coaches step in it in varying degrees over the last couple weeks whether it's you know Mike Norvell lying about the communication that he had had with his team and it seems like that by and large has been smoothed over but you know that damage is a relationship and yeah you know even if even if uh who was it Marvin Wilson that brought it up I think it was Marvin Wilson uh yeah well even you know for Marvin Wilson coming out and saying hey you know what we talk things over and we appreciate coach supporting us that's still yeah, that still damages the relationship, and that's still a little bit of a bump in the road. Now, I'm not saying it's going to make a huge difference in the season, but I, I think for the teams that can really navigate this, and, and it does create a bond and make things, uh, make the locker room an even stronger, more unified community, I think that there is going to be some probably intangible benefit to that um, down the road. Um, and again, it's, it's not; it doesn't have to be a, a public misstep. I mean, what we've seen from Dabo Sweeney and obviously what we heard uh, happened with Danny Pierman in 2017 and the way that that has been handled. I, I wouldn't even say it's been mishandled, but I, I think it's fair to say that Davo hasn't impressed anybody with his response to the situation or his handling of the situation. I don't know if anybody's opinion like overly changed, you know, uh, of, I don't know if anyone's opinion of Davo overly changed, but I, I think it was just kind of a, it's like, really? Like that's, that's how you're going to handle this. You're going to wait a week and then you're going to come out with sort of a lackluster statement. It just, I, I don't know. It just wasn't particularly impressive. And, and you kind of, I don't want to say weed out the coaches that like care and that don't, because I, I believe all the coaches care, but the coaches that are, I guess, better equipped to handle these things. And I don't know what, what communication either of you have had with you know players on the team or just people around the team in terms of what the response has been internally, but I, I imagine that's a, a huge morale boost, and frankly, a morale boost that South Carolina needed because there hasn't been a lot of positive football news in the last calendar year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the players – you know, just talking to a few people around some of the players, maybe some family members, some people that we, you know, got to know during the process. Um, I think they very much appreciate, you know, um, that that Will Muschamp was so supportive that he let it. You know, something that was mentioned is that, you know, he, he sort of told the players, like, doing this and, you know, y'all feel free to join, you know, and uh, sort of took the lead on it. And the, the way I've described it, Pearson is that there was really no gray area with Will Muschamp. He didn't come away from it saying, how does he really feel about it? You know, is he sort of just, is he putting out a statement um, just so he can be seen on social media and retweet it and sort of check the box of, all right, they didn't mess this up too bad, you know, or is it sort of genuine and authentic? And um, look, and some people, you know, may say things that are genuine and authentic in their minds or the minds of others that you know, maybe some people look at it and say, I, I didn't really like the way they mm-hmm. handled that. Or maybe some people just don't agree with supporting players for some insane reason or whatever. But, <laughs> you know, it's just it, it's it's just one of those things where, look, Will Muschamp showed the ability to have the pulse of his team. We, we all know that Will Muschamp is a guy that, you know, there's no universally beloved coach or person in the world, but he's a guy that when you take track record, his players love him in the past. They, they feel like they – you know, they would sort of run through a wall for him. That he supports them, they support him, um, and, and I think this is just another example of that of him understanding and having empathy. I think for his players, for how some of them feel. You know, we saw Jay Urich, you know, who's always been. I mean, he's 
he's going to do something much bigger than football in life, something bigger than I'll ever do, I'm sure, mm. um, just because of the type of kid he is. Um, but, you know, we, we saw him. We, you know, some, some of the kids that they have on this team, I think were really, you know, we already knew, but were really revealed as just, you know, sort of some, some really mature, really special kids. And, and I think the way that they've recruited, some of the young men they've recruited sort of shows that. But Muschamp's response, I, I thought, was really good. I thought when you sort of stack it up, um, what he said, and more importantly, what he did, I think um, was there was no gray area. I think it was just it is what it was, and it was very supportive for the players. And Wes, in some ways, for me, this just further complicates my feelings about Will Muschamp, and, and we're going to have kind of a, a random spinoff hypothetical conversation here in just a second because that's what I love more than uh, anything else, apparently. But it, it, we know, as Chris mentioned, that players seem to love Will Muschamp when they play for him. After they play for him, you know, guys that are in the NFL still continue to speak so highly of Will Muschamp and everything that he means as a developer and as a person and as a coach and, you know, all this stuff. And and yet it seems like there are times when I'm not going to say it's him that's dragging down the locker room, but there is there's something to his approach that doesn't enliven the team as much as it needs to be enlivened. I mean, we, you look at the back half of last season and, yeah, there were some injuries and it's certainly not all Will Muschamp's fault, but that kind of is... It feels like a common characteristic that there there is something about him that that makes it tough for guys to play freely, and I think that's been the biggest thing that's held him back as a head coach. And I don't know exactly what it is, but it's it's amazing. It's it it's almost like he has a different persona as a coach than he does like a coach in the locker room or on the field than you know a, a coach at the podium. And not to say that he's inauthentic, because I I think that he is a very authentic guy, and that's again one of the things that I've appreciated about covering him for the last five years. But if he's like this sometimes, and he's so charismatic and has his players like just just loving him and respecting him so much, and you know whether it's whether it's just because of the football stuff or whether it's because of some of these bigger social issues, like there still seems to be an impossible to define or describe disconnect between the the amount that his players like him and just frankly his track record as a head coach. Uh. <laughs> Because he has the That's X's and O's. He's a unpack. smart guy. He knows as much football as anybody. So he has that, and his players love him, and he's a good recruiter. And like I said, this just this further complicates the disconnect for me. What 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 is it? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you can – and, again, I, I think a lot of people keep wanting to tie everything thing from the last week back into football and what it means for the locker room and stuff like that when really I, I don't I don't think this last week had anything to do with football <laughs> you know I, I think um, it, it was about him supporting his players and mm. listening to his players and being for them being there for them sure well and, and, and let me cut you off for a second because I'm not um, saying that he did that for football reasons or for the PR or anything but what I'm telling you is I will bet you any amount of money that now the players in that locker room are going to be willing to play a little bit harder and push a little bit more for Will Muschamp than probably most of the guys in the Florida State locker room because of what Mike Norvell said a couple weeks ago or last week. So it wasn't because yeah, of football, it, but there there is a relation. That, because this is a relationship business, I think that strengthens the relationship, and I think it was already a strong relationship. Yeah, and I think uh, certainly it, it can galvanize a uh, – a locker room and I uh yeah does South Carolina need to to play better on game days absolutely now uh, is there any like easy answer to, to that question no I, I think football and and why you win or lose a game is um a combination of thousands of var- variables playing out in real time in, in front of us you know and I, I think certainly some of it for South Carolina has been I think there hasn't been enough overall talent on on the field, frankly. Um, has it been sometimes that they've they've played tight um, and haven't been as loose for a game as maybe they need to? A- absolutely. Have have there been game day decisions that maybe you'd want to take back in a close game? You know, absolutely. I, I think it's a the reason it's so hard to answer or describe is because it's never any one thing. It's like a it's really kind of like a percentage thing. It, why why did you lose this game? Well. Um, it was probably fifteen percent for this reason, fifteen percent for this reason, thirteen percent for this, and and so on and so forth. Um, 
there's a there's a I think there's always a, a million different reasons. With, with Muschamp, I think certainly um, the guys finding a way for the guys to maybe play a little bit more loose in some big games is uh, is, is probably a part of that. Uh, now, granted, you know we, we've seen them come out firing against teams like Alabama or that where they're really overmatched talent wise and and uh, and and sort of play. I would say, even though the score didn't dictate it or didn't say it, uh, one of their better games last year. So uh, there, there's a lot of different things that, that go into to winning or losing, I think. Uh, that brings us to today's random hypothetical discussion. And uh, Wes, you got a little bit of a primer on this. I don't know if you primed Chris. I told him the basic outline, but he doesn't know the, the full backstory. On our, let's see, on the halftime show with Jay on, what was that? We were on this Monday, Wes, or was that yesterday? That was Monday, right? Uh, yes, Monday. Monday. Okay. So on Monday, Jay had thrown out a poll question saying, essentially, players are back on campus for voluntary workouts. So what would make you feel better about this upcoming football season? Or, or what, like, if you could wave, I think he said if you could wave your magic wand and change one thing about the football team to make you feel better about the upcoming season, what would it be? And, like, one of them was, it was, like, general talent level, um, strength of schedule, the coaching staff, or nothing. And overwhelmingly, nothing won, which really surprised me because I, I don't think anyone's particularly happy with the state of South Carolina football right now, least of all Will Muschamp and Ray Tanner and the people that are, that I mean, used to fill williams Price Stadium, RIP to, you know, crowds and things like that. But I was really surprised that that was the answer. And in fact, the option that got the fewest votes over the course of the, you know, five or six hours that Jay ran the poll was the coaching staff, and that perplexed me, and that was my vote. So, Chris, I'll let you answer first. Which one of those four answers moves you most? And, and then I'll give you the, the hypothetical and how I arrived at the hypothetical. Well, when you mentioned the schedule, I mean, how many games can you change out? All of them or two or one or – you know what I'm saying? I, I like, guess sort playing? of within the – so, like, you, you can't change any of the East games. Um, I, okay. I guess you can't change a and Maybe instead of LSU, you get one of the Mississippi schools or Arkansas – um, and then non-con, I mean, you have three games that if you don't win, you're probably sub-500 again, and then Clemson, which you can't really change. So I, I would say there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but if you wanted to you know, change it to Arkansas, I guess okay, that's... So, I mean, yeah. I can trade out LSU for Arkansas sure. or something. That yeah. that doesn't move the needle a lot for me. That's still mm-hmm. really difficult, you know? I mean, that's still a really difficult schedule. Mm-hmm. And the other options were coaching staff, or, roster... Or just Yeah, like talent level in the roster. Coaching staff, roster, schedule, and you said there was one more. Well, which is nothing, which is just like, oh, yeah, no, nothing. like I, I feel fine about it. Like let's just let's just go after it. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm really surprised that one out. Seems like you could pick something to change to make well, it better. And part of that was probably how Jay phrased it. He said nothing, just go win. So I think people saw that as like a rallying cry. But I, I think the way okay. Jay meant it, like the intonation was supposed to be like nothing, just go win. You know, okay. not like yeah. nothing, just go win. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if if you're offering a genie in the bottle type of thing, I think you you should always pick something. <laughs> um, I I mean, I would say, and again, I don't know the criteria. You know, how much of the roster you can change. I, I would pick the roster. I mean, mm-hmm. South Carolina's made some changes on the coaching staff to where I think you give those time. Um, and I think in college football, talent rules all. Right? There are some situations where. You're going to inexplicable. How did that school have three first-round draft picks randomly, or, or you know stuff like that? But mm-hmm. you look at the schools who've won the most lately, and voila, they produce the most NFL talent. Now, some of that's getting high-level guys. Some of it's you know doing a good job evaluating, finding some lower-level guys who turn out to be really good, et cetera. There, there's you know a lot of factors in that. But I think anytime. If, if the answer, if the, the proposal is ever, hey, we're going to add more talent to your team, whatever that looks like, I think you take that all day. Um, you know, I, I think, especially when you factor in to me, you know, South Carolina, there were a couple changes that everybody said, you know, that there was sort of consensus on, and that's, you know, here we are. The offense has got to get better. And, you know, gosh, can they stop being so injured all the time mm-hmm. if, if that's possible? And so there's a couple changes made there that when you bring in Mike Bobo, he's got a track record. We don't know if it'll work for a lot of reasons, but I mean, you know, there, there's certainly some evidence that it could based on his track record. And then Paul Jackson, who's done a nice job in the early going, he's got a nice track record. So 
there's been a couple of changes already made there to, to where I would lean more towards, yeah, you need really good coaching, and there's a lot that goes into that. But I always go to stack your roster with talent because then no matter what, that's going to increase your chances. So that'd be my answer. All right, uh, Wes, I didn't get your take on the answer before I introduced the hypothetical. So are you agreeing with Chris or are you going with me? Um, I'm agreeing with Chris. Okay. Just roster talent. I mean, I think that's a that's a good that's a good pick. I think that's a safe pick, but it, it doesn't really, I think, get to the heart of the issue necessarily. Now, this uh, it, it was kind of funny that this ended up being related, but I, I was social distancing. We're sitting outside on a you know porch eating pizza and drinking beer with, let's see, my girlfriend's brothers and then my roommate and longtime uh, good friend, and we we ended up talking about football. And I don't remember how exactly this came up, but. I think it's because we were talking about Will Muschamp. We were just talking about the coaching staff, you know, the Mike Bobo hire, or whatever. We were talking about the football team and remembering the 2005 football team and thinking about how that team seemed to overachieve and they were, you know, a game away from winning the East or whatever in, in Steve Spurrier's first year and how crazy that would have been and, you know, different things like that and thinking about the relative talent level on that team. So the hypothetical that I threw out, or I guess that we discussed Thursday and then I threw out on the show on Monday, and then I'm posing to you two now, is who would win if all else except for talent is equal? So you're playing in williams Bryce, so both teams have home field advantage, or maybe you play on a neutral site so no one has home field advantage. You give them both neutral coaching staff. So I just like pick any head coach, any coaching staff. They have the exact same coaching staff. They run the same offense. They run the well, the, the same offense that they did, the same defense that they did. Uh, like there's, there's no difference other than the talent level of the 2005 South Carolina football team and the 2019 South Carolina football team. 2005, they went seven and five, five and three in the conference. Last year, South Carolina went four and eight, and where they finished two, where they two and two and six in conference. Yeah, that's right. Just beat uh, Georgia and Vanderbilt. Oh, and Kentucky. Yeah, so three and five in conference. Point is, 2005 versus 2019, talent alone. Wes, we'll start with you because you've had a, a little bit of time to think about this uh, as Chris mulls it over. So, Wes, ha- has your opinion changed since Monday? Um, well, sort of listening to Jay, I would, I would actually probably say, especially by the end of last year, the way the team looked, that, and then by the end of 2005, that team actually was playing some pretty good ball. Uh, granted, they lost to, I guess, Missouri in a bowl game and a game that they were winning by a lot. I can't remember by how much. It was by a ton. Uh, but that, that offense started clicking, man. They, they had some, some weapons on offense. And um, the defense sort of miraculously kind of came together. I, I, would, I guess I would probably say 2005. All right, Chris, I'll get your take, just a quick answer, and then we'll break it down because I have a feeling I'm going to disagree with both of you, and then I'm going to have to make my case. So are both both teams are healthy? Do I get the 2019, like the, the starter kit? Sure, yeah, <laughs> everybody's healthy. Yeah. I, you know what? I'm actually going to go 2019, mm. um, okay, because – that and look, that 2005 team, so they beat Tennessee on the road. Now, it's not like that Tennessee team was some juggernaut. They really weren't. Um, and they did beat Florida that year at home. Uh, they lost to Clemson in a game they should have won. They lost to Missouri. That team also, I mean, a they lot of people to Georgia and almost beat Georgia. They almost beat Georgia, yeah, I think two-point game. And so a lot of people may say, well, you're, you're crazy, Chris. That team looked awful last year. You know, how could you say that? But I, I do go back to, you know, number one, it, they, they played some really good teams last year. The schedule was more difficult last year, in my opinion, all things being equal. Um, they played some really, really good teams. Um, and then, you know, the 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 health – I mean, what South Carolina, for example, took to Texas A&M, that was one of the worst performances probably we've all seen mm-hmm. um, since we've been covering the team. But that team was a shell of itself from a roster standpoint and, and from what it was earlier in the year. That, that team also went and beat a good Georgia team somehow on the road against all odds somehow. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I feel like there's a little more talent on this on the 2019 team overall. Um, you know, and I don't know that that's just that's the direction I would go. There, there are definitely some good guys 
on that on that 2005 team. But I mean, they also had some moments where they didn't look very good. You know, the implosion in the bowl game. They got absolutely annihilated by Auburn that year. I mean, you talk about one of the worst performances. I think they lost 48-7. to seven. Mm-hmm. It was just a disaster. Was that the year that um, Auburn had the football for the entire third quarter because they scored and then got an onside kick, like a surprise onside, or was that yeah, a different I, year? I think that was actually when Muschamp was at Auburn. I think that was like the, the Jared Cook game, like the 2007 game, I think. Okay. Okay. I could be wrong. The one that South Carolina lost by seven. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, it, it was just a terrible performance. They got they got beat pretty badly by Alabama as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but they also had some great. Perf- it, it was a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, just just like 2019. But yeah. that's my long winded answer. I, I, well, no, I that, that's good. And, and we're going to get a little more long winded here now. Now, 2005 was also the year that Auburn had a really strong case for playing in the national championship game and did not get to. So mm-hmm. I, I think like losing to that Auburn team, eh, you never want right. to lose by you know 30 plus or whatever. It ended up being for. For South Carolina, but that was a very good Auburn team. But uh, the, the reason that, that I brought it up and that, or that it came up on Thursday and that I was framing it like this, I guess to bring it back to the poll question, is is my vote was coaching staff. And that was a little bit tricky because, again, I think the Bobo hire is, is a solid hire, a very respected, proven guy at offensive coordinator. I mean, I don't know how much of an impact anyone can make in just one year, but if there's anyone that can do it, it's probably someone like Mike Bobo, given the amount of experience that he has in college football, in particular the in particular the SEC. Uh, I think T. Rob's a good coordinator. I, I'm fine with most of the position coaches. That I mean, I don't have any reason to think that they're anything like less than good. And we know that like Eric Wolford is awesome, and I you know really like Mike Peterson. And I, I don't know. I, I think there are good guys there, but to me, it, it seemed like the difference in those teams and why my vote was for the coaching staff is because. I guess to get back to what I was saying earlier, there, there seems to be something about Will Muschamp that at times holds this team back, whether it's in-game decisions like, and I've said this a million times and I'll say it a million more, whenever you punt from the plus 40, or, or especially when it's like fourth and one or fourth and two, like you should automatically just forfeit the game and go home because clearly you are not interested in winning a football game if you're punting from there. That's just that's my philosophy. That's an opinion. Um but things like that, that that I feel like hold this team back. And, and so I was thinking about the talent on, on the 2019 roster versus 2005 and thought, what would happen if you put Steve Spurrier in charge of the 2019 team? You know, not, not what would have happened if he stayed until 2019. You give him the talent that Will Muschamp brought in that he wasn't as interested in trying to get to campus by the time uh, his tenure in South Carolina ended in 2015. But you just let him call some ball plays let him be the head coach of the 2019 team, and put Will Muschamp in charge of the 2005 team. When I frame it like that, Chris, what do you think happens? Again, 2005 team finished 7-5, and five, 2019 team finished 4-8. and eight. What's the difference in records if you switch head coaches? Well, I don't think, you know, I'm actually going to take you off and not even answer it because, look, here's, here's the thing, man. Which coaching, which version of, you know, which Spurrier, because, look, he, Spurrier reinvented himself at South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Okay, it, I, like like you say, you take Will Mush, you take what, what if Steve Spurrier would have hung it up after five seasons at South Carolina or four? It wouldn't have been that impressive. Ah, like, oh, just a retread. If Will Muschamp hung it up now, you know, at South Carolina, I, I think look, Steve Spurrier sort of just floundered. He did some good things, you know, that first year they beat Tennessee, they they beat Florida, they had beaten Georgia, you know. But they just, you know, his first few years, I mean, it was six and six, seven and six. I mean, they went eight and five one year, and that was like the high watermark until they improved. What did he do to improve? Mm-hmm. He shuffled his coaching staff. He adjusted his offensive philosophy. And, oh, by the way, they started landing a bunch of really good players. That's what it was. And so and so Spurrier, yes, he gets full credit for that. If he hadn't have done that, he would also get credit for failing to do that. And it's going to be the same thing with Muschamp. So, Will Muschamp, you know, we're talking about his effect on a football team in general. Well, the first two years, you know, what I sort of you know, put that against is the first two years, he absolutely overachieved at South mm-hmm. Carolina. Okay? So, I, I mean, could we say that, well, he has a negative effect? Would they have won more games without his staff or his coaching then? I mean, I don't really think so. You, so I think it's fair to say that with also saying that, you know, they've underachieved the past two years. Mm-hmm. And so what do you do to fix that? So, I, I mean, if you take that 2005 staff, I mean, Spurrier fired Madre Hill, I think, after that season off his first staff. He eventually shuffled his staff over time, you know, to where he brought back Brad Lawing. He hired Jay Graham. He hired G.A. Mangus. 
Um, they landed Marcus Lattimore and Stephon Gilmore and Jadavion Clowney and all these guys. And so maybe we look back and Will Muschamp shuffles his staff, makes the appropriate moves. They have recruited pretty well, it appears. Maybe they keep that up or even improve on that. I mean, the 2020 class is maybe their best class. So, so I really don't know, man. If you give me the 2005, 2006 Spurrier staff on the 2019 team with that schedule, mm-hmm. if they stay healthy, maybe a game or two extra, but that might be the case for if this team healthy, was healthy last year. You know what I mean? I just don't – I don't know. Now, if you give me – you know, what's the difference in 2011 Spurrier? Well, one thing was probably better assistance. And, and I do think some of his coaching definitely that his attitude made a difference. But if you give me like that staff, you know, he also had a lot better talent in 2012 than he did in 2006 or seven. You know what I mean? And we can look back at Spurrier. I mean, it, it, he would do things every now and then too that negatively affected the team or, or sure. turned in some stinkers. They also turned in some ones that how the heck did they win that game? Mm-hmm. You know, and then he would do something like forgetting to go for two or whatever. <laughs> so, right. I mean, I just – my point is, long-winded way again, I'm sorry. I just don't know, like, if you take – nobody's going to sit here and say Steve Spurrier is not the better coach because that's the track record. Mm-hmm. He's got the track record. But I just don't know when you take those two teams and if you switch the coaches, and it depends on which coaching staff, which version it is, I don't know if there's a huge difference for my money, and I could be okay. wrong. All right, well, no, that, that's good, and we'll get into, I guess, a few more specifics. I kind of want to go through the roster because as I started to look at it, I was I, I was a little bit surprised. But, Wes, I'll, I'll first throw you that same question. You switch coaches. Let's say you give – it's it's 2018 – let's say 2017 Will Muschamp is coaching the 2005 Gamecocks and 2014 Steve Spurrier is coaching the 2019 roster. Uh, same schedules and everything well, like that. I want to – Huh? I, we don't, we only got about ten minutes, so I I want to hear what you have on the rosters before I answer this. Well, I I just kind of wanted to go through it and basically say, Blake Mitchell. It was his sophomore year. It was his best season statistically: twenty three hundred yards, seventeen touchdowns, uh, twelve picks, just under sixty percent completion. I, I think everybody in their right mind would take Blake Mitchell's sophomore year over Ryan Helensky's freshman year, um, even if you say Ryan Helensky stayed healthy, even if we're building that into the hypothetical. But as you asked on Monday, do you get Jake Bentley healthy for the entire season? And in that case, would you rather have senior Jake Bentley or sophomore Blake Mitchell? See, I'm, I'm taking senior Jake Bentley mm-hmm. in that scenario. And, and I, I think, you know, it, it popped in my, my mind when we were talking about that Auburn uh, just debacle for the 2005 team. That, that was with your backup quarterback um in there you know and and I, I think if you look at this past season that you know you had your backup quarterback pretty much the entire season mm-hmm. playing now we we learned later on that Savelle Newton was actually a heck of a quarterback uh playing receiver and then he somehow made the move over to um you know to quarterback later on in his career mm-hmm. so for for and I'm, the 2005 2006 season are now sort of, I guess, melding together in my mind. I know, in 2006 was when Savelle took over as the actual starting quarterback. For right, he only had five while. pass attempts in 2005. Okay, so 2005 he was pretty much uh, receiver only. I know the the Vanderbilt game they uh, did some different fun stuff with him, played him at sort of like Wildcat, running back, and receiver, and that was when he tore his Achilles. So, right, yeah, he uh, finished yeah, with just, about 500 or so yards that year. He was the second leading receiver on the team. Okay, yeah, so uh, not even really sure what point I'm getting to with all that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I am I would take – I think I would take a healthy Jake okay. in that scenario. Chris, healthy Jake or sophomore Blake Mitchell? Mm, I'd take healthy Jake. Cool. All right, yeah. so we're saying – uh, ta- roster talent advantage 2019, but we're going to scratch that one because Jake was injured for 11 twelfths of the year. Uh, next in the uh, backfield, Mike Davis, uh, Mike Davis, number one, was a freshman, rushed for 666 yards, which was, I mean, just very foreboding. Five touchdowns, 
Uh, second leading rusher on the team was uh, Dacus Terman. I've I had never heard of him until I looked him up on Monday. Somebody gave me a hard time about that, but you know, give me a break. I was I was you know twelve years old. Uh, Fifty nine carries, two hundred and forty five yards, and four touchdowns. So Mike Davis and uh, Davis and Terman or Dowdle and Feaster. Um, Feaster. Yeah, I'd take yep. out on yeah. Okay, all right, so that's a pretty easy one. Uh, this is, I think, mo- maybe the more interesting conversation, uh, the most interesting one on the on the offense. In- anyway, you obviously have Sidney Rice, unbelievable year, 70 catches, 1,143 yards, 13 touchdowns, almost 16.5 yards per catch. I I think Sidney Rice is a better wide receiver than Brian Edwards, but the kind of senior year that, that Brian put together, I think, he really earned his spot among the Mount Rushmore of great South Carolina wide receivers. But I will ask you, Chris, first, Sidney Rice or Brian Edwards? Oh, God. Um, I, you know, I, I, I take Sidney, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Brian fan and, and all that. We don't need to go into all that. I mean, if you made me pick, I guess I'm going Sidney. Wes? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, Sydney, Sydney was a special man. Not that Brian's not, but Sydney honestly was on a, another level from most uh, most Carolina players I've ever seen. So I'll, I'll go Sydney. All right, all right. So we'll both both go with Sydney. I, I mean, I, I don't I don't feel strongly about it either way. I mean, Sydney's one of my all time favorite players. Again, that was like partly because I was such a big fan then when I was when I was twelve and have very fond memories of that. Um, and there's a pretty big drop off in both cases. Obviously, South Carolina's receivers were, well, let's just say they had their their fair share of issues last year. Um, a, a precipitous drop off, but even still, and, and part of this because the games played different. Uh, South Carolina's two and three receivers were slightly more prolific than their two and three receivers in 2005. But um, I, I think I think it's advantage. I think it's pretty clearly advantage 2005. When I say, would you rather have Shy Smith and uh, let's see, Kyle Markway was next in catches but for a wide receiver the next in catches was as i'm looking here uh josh van so i think you would probably uh almost certainly rather have savelle newton and kenny mckinley than shy smith and josh van so we can just move on from that one yes yeah, yeah all right I cool. agree. although worth pointing out so this was kenny mckinley's uh freshman year and it was a good freshman year 25 catches and 291 yards uh, but when Jay and I were talking about it on Monday, he was talking about, I mean, that, again, that's a good freshman year. That's like pretty similar stats to Ortre. So, I mean, it, it was really those last three years when he just absolutely, you know, went bananas and became incredibly consistent and a fantastic wide receiver. But also when Sydney's getting all the targets, it's a little bit harder. Um, defensively, a lot, a lot of good guys on, on both teams. You got, you know, Co Simpson, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Joseph, you got uh, Lance Laurie, you got Fred Bennett. You got a lot of guys that ended up playing some NFL football. Uh, a, a lot of NFL football because I think Jonathan Joseph's now in year like you know twenty seven uh, in the NFL. It's, it's incredible. He's just he's an absolute Iron Man. But there's a ton of talent on the 2019 roster as well, including Javon Kinlaw. That I think as an individual you can make a case would be the best defensive player on either team. You have J.C. Horn, who's a future NFL corner. You have Israel Mukwamu, who I, I think is going to have a shot. He's got a lot of upside. He's got a lot of athleticism. Some depth on the defensive line. Um, I, I guess without necessarily going position by position, although you can talk defense, uh, you know, specifically about the defensive backfield if you want to. Uh, Wes, are, are you going edge 2005 defense or edge 2019 defense? Um, I give 2019 defense the edge on the defensive front. Um. I think 2005 defense, the edge at linebacker. Um, certainly 2005 has the edge at safety, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely um, at safety. Corner, though, is interesting. But then corner is interesting, but, I mean, Fred Bent and Jonathan Joseph, that's that's actually pretty strong. Mm-hmm. Um. Believe it or not, I may go to 2005. So you're going yeah, 2005 that. second and third levels and 2019 for the defensive line? Yes. All right, Chris. That's that's where I'm at exactly. 2005 gets – I mean, Jonathan Joseph was really good, and then you look back and say, guy, he played all these years in the NFL. Then it was really solid. Um, Co Simpson alone, for me, puts it over the top. I mean, that guy was – 
so good in college. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean that that the the pick that he made of David Green in that one game. I think that was uh, that was actually the 2004 game. So before Spurrier got here, is one still one of the best plays I've seen in person. Um, but anyway. I give 2005 the edge, but I'm I'm on board with with Wes on his picks too. Yeah, Co Simpson finished uh, the 2005 season with 103 tackles, uh, two and a half for loss, and uh, just just the one pick that year. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, great player in his own right. So all that to say, now that we've kind of gone through it, if we're giving uh, essentially a slight edge to the 2005 defense, it sounds like we're giving. Well, it sounds like you know the offense maybe a wash with uh, wide receiver edge going to 2005, running back edge going to 2019. And then the quarterback edge going to 2019, but given the injury to Jake Bentley, you can't exactly factor that into the season. But the point of all this, uh, and we're, we're going to get out of here in just a second because I know you got to go, Chris. But the point of all this is w- where Wes and Jay and I kind of landed on Monday was that, in honor of you, it would be close if the 2005 team played the 2019 team, and yet one of them finished 7-5 and five, and one of them finished 4-8. and eight. And again, to bring it back to the poll question that was, uh, I guess, the impetus for this conversation on Monday – is that because of the coaching staff? We just decided that the talent is essentially a wash, maybe a slight edge to 2005 if you want to give it. Um, but coaching staff and strength of schedule are the two things that stand out as a difference between a 7-5 and five finish and a 4-8 and eight finish. Does that make a, any more compelling a case for me voting for coaching staff and wondering you know, how much of a difference that makes, Chris? Um, no, not to me, man. It, it really doesn't. I mean, it really doesn't. I think you look at, you know, if we were stacking up, okay, Chris and Wes Pearson pick, you know, Spurrier's best team, which in my opinion was 2012. Mm-hmm. I think that was, you know, the, probably the best coaching staff and best roster. So there you go. Winning combo and you stack mm-hmm. that up against 2019. I mean, that, that wins. So um, I, I think, you know, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Coaching staff is great. It's necessary to have a great coaching staff in terms of recruiting, developing, evaluating, all that stuff. But I, I think roster roster rules, talent rules. And so, you know, for me, when, if, if you are saying that it's close, you know, I go back to, you know, the schedule in 2019 for my money is a lot more difficult. You factor in all the injuries. You know, I, I don't know. And, and, again, not to discount Steve Spurrier, his track record, he's one of the best ever. But that version of his team and that coaching staff was not as good as it would ultimately get at South Carolina. And credit to him for making, you know, all those adjustments and getting those things done to, to increase it. Wes, are you inclined to change your pick or, or at least be more sympathetic to my pick in the in the poll question now that we've kind of gone through all that? I mean, I'll be sympathetic to your pick. I'm probably not changing mine. I, uh, to me, it's it's really about the the quality of the programs that South Carolina was facing back then compared to to now, um, which goes back, you know, like Chris said, to the schedule and uh, and the fact that we're talking about um, the way games were played back then compared to now. Um, it's just it's almost like a completely different sport mm-hmm. in some ways um it's just really really hard i, I think to to compare those things but but yeah the, the schedule w- was definitely different um you know and I, I would say there was probably actually more depth on the 2019 team mm-hmm. as we've talked about it but but i, I think um overall talent yeah it is close but it, it also is just very very hard to to really make those uh comparisons yeah Well, that's about all we have time for today. Uh, Thanks to Jay for throwing out that poll question, and thanks to Joe and other Joe and John Michael for having this conversation with me on Thursday that was sort of, uh, again, the the impetus for all this. And hopefully you all will continue the conversation on the message boards because I'm curious to get uh, y'all's perspective and and people that remember these games definitely better than me, at least as well as uh, Wes and Chris. I'd be curious to hear all y'all's takes on that as well. And if you want to do that, the Insider Forum is a great place to do that. You do have to be a subscriber to Gamecock Central to hop on the Insiders Forum. So go ahead and do that. Be a subscriber to GamecockCentral.com. Again, football players are back on campus participating in voluntary workouts, and soon enough we're going to have practice. So if you don't want to miss any of the news, whether it's recruiting, whether it's football, GamecockCentral.com is the place to go for that. And uh, this podcast will remain free because uh, we love you guys. And all you have to do to support it is rate, review, and subscribe, or at least that's the best way to support it. Share it with your friends if uh, you enjoy it and think somebody else would enjoy it as well. 
Um, and I guess that'll do it for us. A, a tight 60 minutes here today. I appreciate you uh, making time for this, Wes and Chris, because y'all are as busy as ever, despite the fact that we're in quarantine because football is still in swing and recruiting never sleeps. So, uh, Chris, I will let you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wes. Uh, for Wes and Chris, I'm Pearson. Talk to you next week.